you, Mary. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we can be here today to worship and glorify and praise you. Father, be with us. We just pray that we would somehow be able to lift up Jesus and glorify him in everything we do and say. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Patches around the edge of the Shroud of Turin that might have been patched during that time. 
So they've done some tests, both of the blood, both of the, the fabric itself, and again, it's absolutely fascinating. So about 5.30, we get together, and we've been having virtually like a little mini potluck on Sunday nights, and then we've been getting together and watching the video. So come out tonight, and I say be encouraged by this. So our adult classroom and uh, Sunday school, we're studying the Book of Acts right now, and the Book of Acts is absolutely fascinating. Uh, we look today at uh, Peter and John being uh, uh, actually drugged before the Sanhedrin, threatened, beaten, and ordered not to preach the name of Jesus anymore. And so what do they do? They go right back to the temple and start preaching the name of Jesus all over again. And so come out and be encouraged by that as well. All right, the ladies, starting this Tuesday, they're going to be meeting again at Patty's house. And she has a, a book that she'd like to show people who are interested. So you can actually order this in advance uh, if you'd like to get one of these. But they're going to be meeting at 1030, I believe it is. I have to check now. 1030, yes. 1030 on Thursdays. All right, Bible Study Fellowship is going to be starting again for uh, this fall. And again, it's not just anymore for just for women. It's for men, for women, for teens, and there's all sorts of information online. And so in the bulletin, it talks about their website. That's bsf.org. You can get online, and you can actually find out what they're doing. She also has another book, uh, if you'd like to look at it. It's their study guide for this coming year on the book of Revelation. So uh, anyway, if you're interested, be sure and go online and check that out. We have a midweek prayer meeting, Wednesdays at 6.30. And again, we come just to pray. Operation Christmas Child. Now, the whiteboard got replaced over there by the other door. <laughs> so there are two whiteboards, and uh, they do have stickies. And so if you are interested in getting some items that they still need for Operation Christmas Child, uh, you can find out about that. Talk to Debbie Sutherland. She'd be, up, would be willing to give you information as well. But again, why do we do what we do? Here's an excellent video that will tell you all about that. Hello, Shoebox Packers in the Music City area. My name is Yulia, and I represent one out of 188 million children who were blessed to receive an Operation Christmas Child Shoebox gift since 1993. My story originates in a country in Central Asia that is hostile to the gospel. And in my country, it is unlawful to be a follower and a witness for Jesus Christ. But John 1, 5 is true. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Following the fall of the Soviet Union, which my country used to be a part of, there was a deficit and scarcity of anything and everything you could think of, from food to clothes to even toys. But God used that difficult from my country time to create a window of opportunity, just a short period of time, when the government of my country remained restrictive, yet allowed foreigners access in. And at the end of 2001, Samaritan's Curse took opportunity of that window of opportunity and flew in a huge cargo plane that brought thousands of Operation Christmas Child shoebox gifts for children in Central Asia. And I was one of those blessed children to receive one of those shoebox gifts. I was nine years old at that time, and I still remember when I lifted the lid on top of my shoebox gift, this was the very first item right at the very top. This step puppy dog immediately became my new best friend, especially because the toys I was used to having were poor quality and some were even scary. And even though I did not want to share this step puppy dog with anybody, I had to with my sister, with my cousins, as well as friends in the neighborhood. And what I want you to know about this particular puppy dog is that it is 20 years old because it is the original one that came in my shoebox gift at the end of the Southern one. However, as much as I love this stuff puppy dog and all the items that came in my shoebox gift, the Lord used a piece of blue notebook paper to impact my life for eternity. It was a letter from Katie the girl who packed my shoebox gift. She concluded the letter with these words, I'm praying for you, God loves you. And as a nine-year-old Julia, I remember translating those words and wondering, 
why would a stranger halfway across the world who doesn't know me, who has never met me, would not only bless me with some wonderful quality Shabbat's gift, but also pray for me and tell me that there is God who loves and cares for me. And even though I did not fully understand the meaning of those words, I couldn't help and tag that away in my heart, wondering who is this God that he was praying to. Thankfully, at the end of the letter, Katie included a return address, and that led to Katie and I to become some old friends. So for the next number of years, we've exchanged snail mail, and I was so excited to have a friend all the way in the United States. But today, when I look back, I realize that the most exciting part about that temple friendship wasn't the fact that Katie was from this country, but her faithfulness to conclude all of these letters with those same words. I am praying for you. And I continue to wonder, why was a stranger praying so faithfully on my behalf? And most importantly, who is this God that Katie was praying to? Fast forward a few years into 2008, I had the opportunity to come to the United States as a foreign exchange student. And I found myself living with a loving Christian family and attending a Christian school. And slowly the Lord began to soften my heart and bring to the surface the seeds that were planted in it through the Shabbat's gift, through Katie's letters and prayers. In on October 25th, 2008, I opened the door of my heart and invited Jesus Christ in. Then I realized that God truly used something so simple as a Shabbat's gift, letters and prayers of a stranger halfway across the world to first reveal himself to me, but then to bring me into a personal relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. Even though my story ends there, the journey of the Shabbat gift continues on. Since 2009, we have been able to offer a follow-up discipleship program called The Greatest Journey, when the children who have received Shabbat gift are invited to come back, and over the course of 12 lessons, they get to learn who Jesus Christ is, how to have a personal relationship with Him, and are equipped to share the gospel with their friends and family. And upon graduation from the program, they receive a graduation certificate, but most importantly, a New Testament in their native language. And what starts with a simple shoebox gift, an opportunity for evangelism, continues with discipleship, the greatest journey. And do you know what it results in? In multiplication. When we hear testimonies of whole families giving their lives to the Lord, whole communities getting impacted, and even churches being planted. But guess what? None of that would be possible without people like you, because somebody had to pack a shoebox here, somebody had to pray for that boy or girl to be impacted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my story is truly not made possible without faithful shoebox packers like you who year after year continue to pack shoebox gifts, believing that in the hands of the local believers, they will become gospel opportunities. So as you continue to serve the Lord, may God continue to bless you. So I'd encourage you to go to the bulletin board at the back of the church because we just recently received a letter from the Philippines. And again, we put letters in all of our boxes and we talk about our church. <clears throat> anyway, somebody just didn't even go online. They actually paid postage, mailed us a letter, and mailed pictures <clears throat> from the Philippines of their Operation Christmas Child event and how it's touched lives in the Philippines. So anyway, right now we have our coin jar project and our coin jar project is to help raise funds for the shipping costs of Operation Christmas Channel. And so far, $289 has come in for that. So continue to be praying for that outreach as well. So if you're available, come down on Thursdays and, and help out. So, all right. Um, we want to be praying also for our men's fellowship on Thursday mornings because uh, I'm in the, my office and these men come in and harass me terribly. I have been trying to straighten them out, but so far I have not had any results. So anyway, come guys, <clears throat> help me out, please. I think it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> See what I put up with? All right, plant donation list. Uh, if you take a look at the back table, there is a sheet of paper and a pen. Uh, Nick Barrett, <clears throat> who is a professional tree surgeon, works for a tree company, I've asked him to evaluate what we've been doing out here and to come up with a possible list 
of plants that we could put in uh, and then have these little watering tubes water them. And so the idea is that the church really doesn't have funds to buy these plants. But if you would like to look at the list and choose to donate a plant, that's what that list is for back there. You can just sign up by it. And uh, again, once we get them, uh, we'll figure out about putting them again. So that's part of the beautification project, okay? The, 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 the ramp is all intact, and the steps are all intact. But we want to make the area look really nice. All right, we need to be praying for the peace of Israel, <clears throat> the peace of Jerusalem. And again, I was listening to the news, and just yesterday, again, uh, Israel was attacked by rockets, not only from the north, but also a long-range rocket from the Houthis. And apparently, no one was killed. There was no actual damage. Uh, but uh, these rockets are still hitting. And there's still parts of northern Israel that have been evacuated, where people cannot go back to their homes because of what is going on. So Hamas is being dealt with in the southwest. And so what they're saying is now, very, very possibly, a new full-scale war will be breaking out to the north. And so we need to be praying for Israel. We don't have to go into Lebanon and deal with uh, the Hezbollah there. They're still trying to figure out how to deal with the Houthis down in Yemen. And again, the power behind all of this seems to be Iran. And again, from what I read in Scripture, I believe the power behind the throne is Satan himself to try to destroy the people of Israel. We're going to talk more about that when we get into our message time. All right, as we pray for our alliance prayer requests, there's prayer requests from Indonesia and Japan, and I encourage you to read both of those, and please be praying for these areas. That's in Asia, but of course the alliance is working around the world. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your love, and Father, we thank you for the way you're working. Father, for Operation Christmas Child, what a fantastic opportunity. And Father, we thank you for this lady's testimony, who how this shoebox opened the door to something further when she finally came to know Jesus. And now she is involved herself in this ministry. Father, we just pray that you would bless our efforts, bless our offering. And Father, we would pray for Israel. Father, we know that they are going through a very, very difficult period of time. But again, that's totally understandable when we take a look at the prophecies of Scripture. Father, we pray that they would look to you. Be with them during this time. And Father, for our international workers around the world, Father, please give them all that they need in the Holy Spirit of God and empower them in a mighty way. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. The Lord tells us in Psalm 46 to be still and know that I am God. Turn to 347, be still my soul, verses 1 and 3.
as we come to our prayer and share time, the first prayer request I want to uh, give you is uh, from Steve and Carolyn Lesur. I want to give you an update for those of you who are not aware of what's been going on. As you know, Carolyn went in for surgery uh, last Thursday. The hope was that they could remove this tumor. So here are the uh, prayer requests that I got. First of all, in the morning, it said, Good morning, Steve. Carolyn started her surgery at 8 o'clock this morning. They completed the laparoscopy. All is clear. They will now proceed with the Whipple procedures to remove the tumor. They will update me every two hours. She is in God's hands now. Continue to pray. We appreciate it. Then at 2.08 p.m. on Thursday, I got this message. Hi, Steve. Just to give you an update, Carolyn is out of surgery and headed for recovery. The doctor came to talk to us. They were unable to remove the tumor because it was so embedded. We are doing okay. A little bit of shock, but we still get through it. She is in the Lord's hands for faith and hope. Please pray for us. We have a tough times ahead. And then this morning, Steve sent this. Update for Carolyn for today. She is in good spirits and will be removed off her IV pain medication today and will start taking pills. We anticipate returning home tomorrow. Thank you for your prayers. So we need to be praying for them because we don't know what the next step is going to be. She still has this cancerous tumor. It is definitely smaller than it was <clears throat> after all the chemotherapy. But uh, again, they're going to have to be talking to these doctors. These are experts in the subject. So please be praying for them. Then we've been also asked to pray for a Julie Bevor. Is that how you pronounce her last name? Uh, yeah, Nick and Kayla had to go over to the coast very quickly because Julie had fallen and hit her head. And originally, they thought she might have brain damage. But they did CAT scans and everything. She has no brain damage, but apparently was severely injured. So they had been over on the coast helping to take care of Julie. So they asked for prayer for that. <clears throat> then also, we need to be praying for uh, Brenda Hare. Betty's not with us this morning, but Brenda has now been put on hospice care. And uh, apparently, this is a liver failure. So uh, tomorrow, Betty and I are going to go together and see Brenda. So please be praying for her, because we're not sure where she stands with the Lord. So. All right, there's lots of other uh, prayer requests in the bulletin. And again, we uh, want to be praying for all of them. But we have any other updates that we need to be praying for? Gloria. Yeah, Gloria. Uh, Ron and Gloria Garcia, uh, as you know, has been going through multiple health issues and is not doing well. She can get out now a little at a time. But anyway, she has doctor's appointments coming up, so we need to be praying for Gloria. She's on our list. So. All right. We have a lot of travelers, a lot of people gone, as you know, and so we need to be praying for them as well. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your love, and we just pray that you be with us. Please encourage our hearts this morning. Father, we don't always understand how, how you work or why you do some of the things you do. But Father, we trust you. Put all these people in your hands. And Father, we pray that you would work in such a way that Jesus would be glorified. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> we have been doing this through the Bible reading. And uh, again, I hope you are following with us. And if you are not, and you'd like to know where to read, let me know. And I'll be happy to send you text messages or emails or anything <clears throat> to get you on board. But anyway, today we are reading in Isaiah 11 through 13. What a tremendous passage of scripture. We read about the root of Jesse. And who is the root of Jesse? Jesus Christ. And we read about the millennial kingdom. Don't let anybody ever tell you that the millennium is only talked about in Revelation chapter 20. It is talked about throughout scripture and definitely prophesied in the Old Testament, definitely in the book of Isaiah. So very, very encouraging, uplifting passage of Scripture. Then we read Psalm 145, and my little note was, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And so that was definitely a song of worship. Then, as we got into 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I just wrote down two words. Unveiled faces. You know, when Moses <clears throat> would go before the Lord, he would come out and his face would be shining, but then it would kind of dissipate. 
And so he used to cover his face, veil his face, because he didn't want people to see the difference. And uh, anyway, Paul is saying that we as believers can meet before him and serve him with unveiled faces. And so, what a tremendous passage of scripture. All right, well, if you have your Bibles now, <clears throat> please turn to Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to be talking about the unknown day and hour. And again, I am really doing this by faith. Uh, Steve Lasur is gone, and Vicki Ruley is gone. And so Mark Sutherland is running in the PowerPoint. I don't know what you're going to see on the screen, okay? I have no clue what you're going to see on the screen. But we're going to do our best. At least Debbie's by him to elbow him. Can you get the free screen up here? All I've got is what we've got there. I don't have the free the next slide. Uh, and what did you push? Uh-oh. <laughs> I'd have to come down and probably have to start things all over. I'll just keep going like this. Boy, I don't know why that happened, because it hasn't happened for a long time. <clears throat> I wonder if there's a, a, a nut loose behind the controls. Mm. 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 All right. Well, believe it or not, this passage is still Tuesday of Passion Week. So remember, I've, I've grilled you on this over and over again. Context, context, context. Jesus is continuing his teaching on the events and signs of the end times. We are in what we often refer to as the great eschatological discourse. By the way, there is a notebook down there with everything. My whole message. Yeah, so you might be able to kind of follow along that way. Then he can just read that. Yeah, he could. Write this down. Oh, my knee is hurting again. All right. So, um... Again, I want to remind you that there are many, 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 many varied opinions as to exactly what all this means. I am not going to try to give you the whole plethora of opinions. What I'm going to try to give you is my humble opinion of how I understand these scriptures all come together. And again, it is a humble opinion. Again, we're talking about the future, and we're talking about the fact that the Lord has not always made everything totally clear into what he has to say. And so, uh, anyway, we're going to do our best. But, I firmly believe that there's a difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ to the earth to set up his millennial kingdom. I believe that the rapture is imminent, and that the only interpretation that makes any sense to me in this passage of Scripture is that Jesus is referring to the rapture of the church uh, in this particular teaching. So I'll, we'll get to this. And again, if you disagree with me, that's fine. As I've said to people over and over again, I give you complete permission to be wrong. Okay? Very good. All right, now our key verse. You found that? See that? Verse. Good. All right, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What does that mean? Well, the point is this. Even though we can't know the when, we can know the what. Jesus is coming. And again, we can debate till that proverbial cow comes home. I don't know where that cow is. It's off somewhere. We can debate till it comes home. But the fact is, we don't know when. And if anybody comes along, we're going to talk about this later in the message, and tells you they have figured out the when, I can guarantee you that's not when Jesus is coming back. Okay, We can't know the when, but we can know the what, and the what is Jesus is coming. So the question that I even ask myself is this, am I ready for Jesus coming? Am I ready? All right, so three things that we're going to talk about very briefly concerning the day and hour comparing the days of Noah and coming of the Son of Man. Three C's, concerning, comparing, and coming. First of all, concerning the day and hour. Now again, remember, Jesus has just been in the temple. He had all these discussions with the leaders. Finally, they got to the point where they were afraid to ask him any more questions. But as they're leaving the Temple Mount, going down into the Kindred Valley, up onto the Mount of Olives, his disciples 
look back and they see this beautiful complex and they comment on it. And Jesus gives a short and long-term prophecy. He says this is going to be destroyed. And man, they, they are concerned. And so they ask him some questions. So Jesus sits them down on the Mount of Olives and they're looking back now across the Kippen Valley at the Temple Mount. And he starts this big discussion. And so part of this discussion now is in an answer to their question. In verse 36 of chapter 24, it says, Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. To give this idea the strongest emphasis, Jesus claimed that this knowledge was reserved for his Father only. Do we really believe that? That only the Father, God the Father, is the only one that knows when this is going to happen. If Jesus himself, at least during his earthly ministry, did not know this day and hour, it emphasizes the foolishness of any later person making certain predictions regarding the prophetic timetable. So, I'm taking this at its face value. Jesus is saying... Only the Father knows, which means only the Father knows. None of us, well, we can know the season, we can know events surrounding it, we can be getting prepared, but only he knows. Now today, online, you can watch many videos where people believe they have figured out the date. If you can believe them, we won't be around for November's election. Seriously. Go on YouTube, type in the rapture. And there's all these people, and they have all these calculations, and they've been taking a look at the sun, the moon, the stars. They have everything all figured out, and yeah, Jesus is coming back in October, and we won't even be around here for the election. My response is, great! I'd love to be out of here. Okay? But, every person who's ever predicted a date throughout my lifetime has always been wrong. So when Jesus says the day and hour, what is he speaking of? And what is Jesus talking about? Well, let's talk about now. We talked about concerning the day and hour. Let's talk about comparing the days of Noah. In verse 37, Jesus says this. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. All right, what does that mean? As the days of Noah were. Jesus explained what he meant by the days of Noah. It means life centered around the normal things, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, in other words, life will be business as usual, reprobate perhaps, but usual. That the coming of the Son of Man takes place at an unknown time can only be true if in fact life seems to be going on pretty much as usual, just as in the days before the flood. Now before we actually go back and take a look at some of these passages, I want to remind you that there are different opinions as to what this means. Okay, well, I'm going to take you to Genesis chapter 6 in a minute, and I'm going to see what I think it means. It means that mankind as a whole is living in sin. There is a new set of videos out, and you can go online and watch them. There is a pastor who has churches in Moscow, Russia, and he believes that what it's talking about is that the angels came down and had sexual relationships with people messed up their DNA, and the Nephilim somehow appeared, these giants. And he believes that in order to destroy this bad DNA, the only family that hadn't been corrupted DNA-wise was Noah's family. So he destroyed everybody else to start with the DNA pool all over again. Well, that might be true, but when I read scripture, I don't think that the subject was DNA, but was sin. So let's go to Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair, and took his wives as, as they, any as they chose. 
The Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man, for he is flesh, and yet his days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was continually only evil. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and had grieved him in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So what I believe was happening was sin. Sin was multiplying greatly. Now, if DNA had been corrupted, maybe. But I don't think the issue here is DNA. I think the issue is man's sin. And God was going to have to do something about it. But Noah's family, Noah, found grace in the sight of the eyes of the Lord. Did that mean that Noah was perfect? No. But I believe that Noah was a man of faith. And this is the result. We also have this talked about over in the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be kept for judgment, and if he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, was set on others, then he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, making them an example to those afterwards who would live ungodly lives. And if he delivered righteous Lot, who was distressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man lived among them, and what he saw and heard in their lawless deeds tormented his righteous soul day after day. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from the trial, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, especially those who walk after the flesh in pursuit of unclean desires and despised authority. Mm -hmm. So what I think the issue here is sin. Sin had corrupted the world. So you not only have the example of Noah, but you even have the example of Sodom and Gomorrah and of Lot. The interesting thing is that in verse 9, it says, Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial. So you have Noah and his family. They enter the ark. Have you noticed that if you've read scripture that it took 120 years to build the ark? So for 120 years, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And at the end of 120 years, did thousands of people enter the ark? No, just Noah and his family. No one else would listen. And so that ought to be a little bit of encouragement to you if you've been witnessing the people and they just don't want to listen. Because they sure didn't listen to Noah. So, but they entered the ark. God closed the door. Have you ever noticed that? Noah didn't close the door. God closed the door. And when the flood came, it wasn't just rain, but the, 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 the deep burst forth as well. And Noah and his family floated up and out. God rescued them out of the flood, which I believe goes into what we're going to talk about next. So we see concerning the day and hour, comparing the days of Noah, now the coming of the Son of Man. Now I realize these next verses are very controversial. But again, I'm going to try to give you what I believe makes sense to me, at least, when I read these. Chapter, verse 40. Two will be in the field. One will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, and the other left. The two men will be in the field. One will be taken, and the other left. Jesus here pointed to curious disappearances, to a catching away of some at the coming of the Son of Man. This is also described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. Before we get to that, again, there's great debate as to when this takes place. There's some who says, well, Jesus here has been talking about the tribulation in the nation of Israel, so this, this, this can only happen at the end of the tribulation. Well, if that's the case, then why would we be going up and coming right back down again? And what about some of the other things that are being talked about here? 
So let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 for just a minute, verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the word, Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the uh, Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So in my pea brain, what I believe Jesus is talking about here is the rapture of the church. Because some will be taken, some will be left. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, it goes on to say this. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord will come. But know this. If the owner of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for an hour when you least expect the Son of Man is coming. So remember that chart we put on the screen of end time events? We believe from Scripture that the tribulation is going to be seven years long, that it can be divided very equally into two, three and a half years. The abomination of desolation takes place about halfway through. It's three and a half years left. If that is the case, if Jesus is here talking about his second coming, people would be able to look at the calendar and say, we know just about when Jesus is coming. Well, the dilemma is resolved by seeing that there are actually two second comings. One is in the air for the church, commonly known as the rapture. The other is to the world coming with the church, commonly known as the second coming of Jesus. The contradictions in Matthew 24 and much of the rest of prophecy are often solved by seeing there are really references to two returns of Jesus. So again, I've often talked to people and they've said, well, I don't understand. Well, what's this about Jesus' second coming? I firmly believe there is the rapture of the church and the second coming. Again, in the rapture of the church, we go up. We meet Jesus in the air. With the second coming, we come with Jesus to the earth. For him, for his second coming, to set up his millennial kingdom. It's interesting that Suetonius, you've heard of him, haven't you? Tells us that it was a piece of Julius Caesar's policy never to foreacquaint his soldiers of any set time of removal or onset, that he might ever have them in readiness to draw forth whithersoever he would. What does that mean? Julius Caesar never told his troops when they were supposed to go into battle, when they were supposed to leave. They were supposed to be ready at any moment. Because if he showed up and said go, they had to be ready to go. So, there's the coming of the day and hour, concerning the day and hour, comparing the days of Noah and the coming of the Son of Man. All right, I want to put three headlines on the board. The first is the great disappointment. There have been times in church history when people, well-meaning people, students of God's Word, have studied God's Word and thought they had things figured out. The great disappointment in the Millerite movement was the reaction that followed Baptist preacher William Miller's proclamation that Jesus would return to earth by 1844, which he called the Second Advent. His study of the Daniel 8 prophecy during the Second Great Awakening, led him to conclude that Daniel's cleansing of the sanctuary was the cleansing of the world from sin when Christ would come. And he and many others prepared. When Jesus did not appear on October the 22nd, 1844, Miller and his followers were disappointed. Miller concluded that 457 B.C. 
was the beginning of the 2,300 day, which he converted into year prophecy, which meant that would end about 1843 to 1844. Because 457 BC plus 2,300 years equals 1843. And so too the second advent would appear about that time. So William Miller, a Baptist minister, a preacher of the word, a student of the word, misinterpreted Daniel's prophecy. And he converted days into years, and he come up, came up with a date. He had everybody ready for Jesus' coming, and it didn't happen. Here's another one. 88 reasons Jesus will return in 1988. Edgar C. Weisenach was not your common prophet, but was a former NASA engineer who boldly and confidently declared that Jesus would return in 1988, saying, only if the Bible is an error am I wrong. 300,000 copies of his book, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988, was freely mailed to pastors across the United States. And I got one, okay? Used to sit on my desk. 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. Eventually, 4.5 million copies were sold. Edgar gained quite a significant following around the Christian world and did regular special programming on the Christian Trinity Broadcasting Network where special instructions on how to prepare for the rapture were shared. When Jesus didn't return in 1988, Edgar then went on to readjust his calculations to 1989. And I received a book. I had it in my office. 89 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1989, 1993, 1994, each with its own book. May the 21st, 2011, The Rapture. Harold Campion was an influential American Christian radio broadcaster and evangelist who predicted that the rapture would occur on May the 21st, 2011, because of a formula that he was able to calculate represented by the equation of atonement times completion times heaven equals end of time. Now, by the way, when Trudy and I were students at Simpson College uh, in San Francisco, the preeminent Christian radio station in San Francisco was run by Harold Campion. He was a respected Christian leader. But Harold suffered a stroke a few months after he predicted that the rapture was going to take place and retired, passing away two years later. Didn't happen. Though there can be an overwhelming focus on the signs of the end times, it's important for us to never forget the words of Jesus in John 14, verses 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. So, what's our key verse again? Matthew 24, 36. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So the point is this. Even though we can't know the when, we can't know the what. Jesus is coming. So you can have your opinion as to how all these things play out that Jesus is talking about. But I firmly believe that there is a difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. I believe what Jesus was warning believers here at this point was the rapture is going to come when we least expect it. You know, our house hopefully is prepared for uh, thieves, for robbers. For one thing, we have all of our doors locked. We even have a deadbolt on the front door. We even have the storm door locked. Not only that, but we have stickers on the different windows saying this house is armed. And believe it or not, we do have some weapons that are armed in the house, but they are locked up in 
gun-proof safes. Children cannot get to them. Okay? We are prepared. But guess what? One of these days, we may come home and find our house broken into. Okay? Most thieves do not send you a letter saying, Mr. and Mrs. Cogswell, I want to let you know that we're going to break into your house there in Athena on September the 1st, 2024, uh, at 3 a.m. in the morning. So we want to make sure that you stay sound asleep. Don't bother us as we carry off all your valued uh, possessions. Thank you very much, the thief. That doesn't happen, does it? Thieves come when you least expect it. In the days of Noah, I believe the issue was the world was in sin. Look at the world today. The world is in sin. <clears throat> Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He warned people for 120 years, but they wouldn't listen. Finally, when everybody was in the ark, the Lord closed the door. And then the flood came when they least expected it. They were living life as usual. What are people doing today who don't know you, who don't know Jesus? They're living life as normal. So the question is, am I ready for Jesus coming? Am I prepared? Am I sharing with others? Father God, we thank you for your word. And Father, we just pray that it will be an encouragement to our hearts. Father, I know there's a lot of different debate as to how all the different fine things play out. But Father, help us to be ready for you. Help us to look to Jesus. For it's in his name we ask. As believers, we can be sure that when the Lord does return, we will be with Him. We're going to turn to 527. Glory to His name. Let's sing glory to our Lord's name. Verses 1, 2, and 4.
Jesus' name. Amen.